Hello everybody and welcome to Castle Fest and tonight's live event, What is a Castle? I'm Rachel Pickering, an archaeologist with HES and I'll be your host for tonight's event. So tonight is all about exploring what makes a castle a castle. We'll be taking a virtual tour of the west coast of Scotland to find out about three very different castles. And the event kicks off a fortnight of different activities aimed at celebrating the heritage of Scottish castles. We'll hear from three different speakers and we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion from the audience. If you'd like to ask us a question at any point, you can do this via our Facebook page by logging on or by logging on to your YouTube channel account with your Google account. The event is also being recorded and will be available afterwards to watch at your own leisure. So, Scottish castles seem to capture the imagination in a way that not many other heritage sites do. They're a tangible connection to our past. Many of us explored them as children. Um, we had dreams of finding secret passages or hidden treasure. Because of what they are, they've never been hidden in the landscape or understated. Their positioning is often very deliberate. They're prominent in the Scottish landscape. They're a strong part of our local and national identities and are a key part of placemaking. Some have been royal residences and major garrisons, others showy residences for local landlords. Each castle has its own unique history and many have strikingly different appearance, appearances. They've had many different roles too, as well as being physical representations of power, they were centers of community and workplaces, places of refuge and entertainment, places for lavish celebrations and for the routine running of a state business. At Historic Environment Scotland, we care for over 60 different castles and there are hundreds more across every corner of the country. Some are at least 800 years old, while others were built in the 19th or 20th centuries. All of these go by the name of castle, but what exactly makes a castle a castle? Just how different are these sites? Over the next hour, we hope to go some way to answering some of these questions, and of course, lots of your own. First up tonight, we're going to hear from Nikki Scott talking on Kishmoor Castle. Nikki has a PhD in Scottish history from the University of Stirling. She's been working with HES for over 10 years, giving advice on matters ranging from the display of early medieval carved stones to rubber ducks in gift shops. Nikki will be giving an introduction to Kishmoor Castle on the Isle of Barra. The perception of Kishmoor, like many castles, is still one of a place of military might a place in which control could be imposed on rebellious populations or invading enemies. But castles are much more versatile than this. What they were and are often depends on the time and place. So at this point, I'll hand over Nikki to explain more. Uh, hello and thank you and welcome one and all. Uh, this will be a very brief introduction to Kishmul since there is uh, far more to be said about it that can be said in my allotted time. Uh, so if you want to learn more, obviously do go when travel allows visit or seek out our statement of significance on the website, to learn a bit more. So Kishmoor Castle is one of the best preserved castles, uh, medieval castles in the Western Isles. 
Uh, it sits, as you can see here, uh, on a small island in Castle Bay at the south end of Barra in the Western Islands. Its location makes it visible from all sides of the bay, and particularly visible from the town of Castle Bay itself. It's one of the most impressively sighted castles in Scotland and plays a significant part in prom promoting the island to the wider world, and particularly to the McNeil diaspora, the family with which it is most closely associated. Its origins have been debated, but what available evidence there is suggests it was probably built by the chief of the clan McNeil shortly after receiving the lands of Barra from Alexander, third lord of the Isles in 1427. Although built by a relatively minor clan chief, it was part of the wider lordship of the Isles, making it a historically significant icon of Gaeldom and of a time and place where Gallic military power, culture and language held absolute sway. Now at first glance, a tiny island in the Outer Hebrides perhaps seems an odd place for a castle. Despite decades of scholarship, oh, my cat wants to learn as well. Despite decades of scholarship, there's still a very popular perception of castles as being something of a Norman invention. Following the conquest of England in 1066, they spread across the British Isles and represent a foreign imposition on a native population. There's also the additional view of castles as a lowland phenomenon associated with knights and war and daring do, the mighty strongholds acting as a bulwark against trebuchets and later against cannons. But castles are so much more than this, and their versatility of design and function made them the des res for families across the country and well beyond the centres of crown control in the central belt. Kishmo Castle thus has a lot to say about the nature of lordship in the Gaelic speaking world. As you can see here, Kishmill contains many structures within a surrounding curtain wall. Most prominent is the tower house to the, the square structure to the top of the picture there. This probably predates the main curtain wall, and so is the first medieval structure probably uh, on, the, uh, on the site. Um, this contains the main living accommodation, providing space for the clan chief and his family, and possibly key members of the household as well. Also within the castle is a hall, a, a bigger space for ceremony, for feasting and for displays of authority. It also contained a kitchen, a chapel and storage uh, for all the provisions that were needed to keep a household going. Therefore, the castle provides everything uh, that a lord requires to suitably house himself and his family and his household and his guests. And although my emphasis here is to try and get away from the notion of the castle as a military uh, function solely. The crenellated wall walk and parapet and thick curtain walls does give that display, that sense of defence, also being something of a factor. Excuse me if I get rid of the cat again. Fudge is so keen to learn about castles, I can't tell you. One of the things that is contained outside the castle walls uh, are mooring points for ships, because most importantly, Kishmul was a base for Berlin's, for the galleys of the McNeils. You can think there's a wee picture of a stone carving of a galley coming up just in a second. Um, it's a, yet yeah, oh, no back one. There we go. These are found on some of the carvings across the, the, the Western seaboard emphasising the importance of the seaways in this area of the country. Uh, Ian Fisher has highlighted these as an expression of authority within a maritime lordship. And although the McNeils of Barra were a relatively small family within the lordship of the Isles, they were major participants in this key aspect of lordship in this area. So the castle acted to provide a base from which they could exercise this power. And this was something of a trend within this region in the 15th century. The McNeils raided across the Western Isles and as far afield as Ireland. They're mentioned in diplomatic correspondence in England uh, in the reign of Elizabeth I. And they gained something of a reputation as fearsome freebooters. And a late 16th century source indicates that the McNeil commanded a force of at least 300 men. So Kishmul was not just a place for display, but was a place for the exercise of lordship. Is not a place where you would defend against a trebuchet. Here we have this reconstruction of Dunstaffnage Castle, another important castle within the Western Seaboard. Based on our closest archaeological understanding and documentary evidence, it gives an impression of just how important the seaways were in this period. 
Travelling by loch, by river, by sea was considerably easier than travelling across land in this period. And so controlling probably the best harbour at Barra was an important means of uh, display and ownership uh, for the McNeil in this period. However, this did change across time. The way you express lordship began to change and a much greater desire for privacy became the norm. And so the McNeils eventually move on to Barra, eventually ending up in a now demolished mansion house, which was much more the des res of the time. And Kishmo Castle itself began to fall into ruin. A fire in 1795 meant that by the time the McNeils had uh, sold it in 1837, the place was very much a ruin. Uh, locals as well began to uh, use the site as a quarry. I mean, violate all that good building stone, go to waste. Uh, and much of the castle ends up as ballast within the local shipping field as well. I mean, recycle, reuse. But that doesn't mean that the McNeils lost interest in the castle. There's considerable ev evidence that uh, the wider diaspora retained an interest. And in the 1900s, the 45th clan chief, Robert Lister McNeil, purchased it and began a program of restoration. There is, however, no detailed plan uh, of the castle prior to McNeil's work. The only real record we have is of a ground plan prepared by the Royal Commission of the Ancient Historical Monuments of Scotland, which is now part of Historic Environment Scotland uh, in the 1920s, and some photographs, some of which you've just seen. These do form a record of sorts and allow us to appreciate the extent of the 20th century works. But our ability to fully understand medieval structure has been severely compromised, and thus it affects our ability to truly understand what messages the McNeils in the 1400s were sending with Kishmil Castle. So thus much of McNeil's restoration is based on what castles should have according to his ideas in the 1900s, rather than on detailed archaeological and architectural details. So the castle as it stands with its hall, with its tower house, with its kitchen, with its terraced house, are the products of what was considered normal and right and proper for a castle across the mid 1900s. And many of these ideas are changing. In some ways though, McNeil did follow particular principles uh, of restoration, though how far he formally understood these is unclear. He did seek to retain uh, the maximum amount of medieval fabric that he could, which is great. It leaves us something to work with. Um, he only removed the minimum he needed to make the castle safe, uh, which is fabulous. Um, and, and he minimised the adaptation uh, of surviving uh, fabric as well, so that we are still able to get a clue and we're relatively clear that the outline that we have generally follows the outline that was there in the 1400s and 1500s. However, in his memoir on the work Castle in the Sea, he also noted that while he had tried to restore meticulously, he had also endeavoured to make the castle habitable as we would regard that word in the 20th century, and also to secure the utmost durability for future centuries, which is why he uses a lot of concrete uh, in his uh, reconstruction work. Then too, I have tried to consider what modernization would have taken place if my family had continued to live in the castle. So essentially what we have now in Kishmil is the remnants of a medieval castle that has been restored by someone who wanted to make it habitable uh, with the creature comforts expected uh, of the 20th century. Uh, so fireplaces, lights, bookcases, comfy chairs, there's running water, there's a bath, toilets, you know, all these uh, things that we would expect. And also something that is imagining what his ancestors might have done. So if they had taken the core of a medieval castle and added on to it in the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries, as is the case with many mainland castles that are now famous country houses. But the fact that he is aware of this fact of the castle as a key residence is really something that is very interesting. He's not just restoring it for military might, but as a comfortable place to live. He's also giving a nod to the display necessary by restoring the Great Hall. Here we can see uh, displaying coats of arms, a top table where the chief could sit. Um, he's giving a nod again to that space where chiefs could feast, could celebrate, could party, could conduct business, could dispense justice. 
And this space is still now today used for ceremonial use. Um, so that long history tradition continues again at Kishmul. One of the things that has certainly been fairly authentically returned uh, to Kishmul is the sense of enclosure gained by the rebuilding of the curtain wall and by the reintroduction of buildings into the courtyard. The smaller space left in the courtyard by the return of these buildings gives a much more clear indication of what these spaces would have been like in their active use. We're very used today to walking into many ruined castles and finding wide open spaces, often with landscape gardens in the middle. But this takes away very much from the, the tight, enclosed, busy, full space that these places would have been. As a fairly final point, it's worth highlighting that much of the funding for this work was uh, undertaken by donations uh, from the wider McNeil diaspora, emphasising again that the connection to place remains a key part of individual and family identity. So if we're asking what is a castle, for Kishmil the response is not really or solely a place of military might, but it's a place that provided living space, ceremonial space, party space, worship space, cooking space, but most importantly is a space that informs our understanding of lordship and identity across many different times. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nikki. That's got me itching to get out to Barra when we're when it's possible. <laughs> it is an absolutely fascinating site. It really is stunningly situated and is absolutely fascinating. Um, and, and definitely worth going and just having an explore. Um, the boat trip out alone is uh, kind of worth the entrance fee. I can imagine. Um, if anybody has any questions, we have time for one or two on Nikki's presentation before we move on to the next speaker. If not, I will ask a quick one. Um, it's quite an unusual location on a, a very small island um, set apart from the rest of Barra. Do you think that's deliberate? Do you think that's defensive or making some other kind of statement? It's unlikely to be defensive, um, especially considering that the curtain wall is likely to post-date the tower. So the first structure that's being built there is the tower. Um, and the design and layout of that clearly suggests that defence is not really a major issue. So there's ground floor access that isn't secured um, with a timber floor above. So, you know, an, an enemy, if they were able to get onto the island, could get in there, set fire to it, and the whole tower goes up. So it, it's probably much more, I think, a statement of the sea power. So being able to have quick command and access to the Berlins then quick access away and out, and then quick access back for any necessary repairs um, is much more likely. So highly strategic. Yeah, very strategic, very strategic. That's great. And we have one quick question from one of our viewers um, who wonders what the highest population of the place was, I presume from of, of the castle and the kind of castle lands. Yeah, uh, that's difficult to say. Um, it would obviously fluctuate. So if the McNeil was in residence, it would be higher because there'd be him, family, any children, household officers, close retainers, much bigger castle staff. Um, if the McNeil was away elsewhere, then it's, you know, a skeleton staff. So, you know, you know probably a, a, a watchman and a couple of sentries at most. Um, so it really could vary between, um, you know, two or three to many dozens. Um, unlikely to be all of the 300 or so men that he commands residing there. Most of them are probably on Barra somewhere, but uh, certainly when he's in residence, you know, there's many dozens likely to be occupying the castle with him. It's amazing how much these places fluctuated, even within small timescales. Uh, yeah, and it could be one day it's, you know, the watchman on his own and the next minute the McNeil turns up and, you know, it's suddenly chaos. Mm -hmm. You just hope the messenger got there in time to warn them that they were coming. <laughs> and there's, we, we've got time for one more quick question. Um, this one's from Brock Harling on YouTube. Um, he noticed a puddle in the on the floor in one of the pictures. Is there an issue with the castle and its concrete? 
Uh, the concrete is causing a few structural issues. Our uh, architects and our monument conservation units are looking at ways to try and uh, uh, kind of rectify that. Obviously, it's a medieval ruin and it was not wind and water tight for a long time. And then, you know, there's been restoration work done on it. So, yeah, th there are a few issues, but it is being looked at for a, a plan to see how to amend it. It's certainly a never ending job keeping these castles um, wind and water tight and still yes. going. Yes, but I mean, what better job is there in the world than looking after <laughs> these places? Exactly. Um, we'll have time for more questions at the end, but at this point, I think we'll um, bring up our next panelist for the night. So next up we have Derek Alexander, who is Head of Archaeological Services at the National Trust for Scotland. Derek will be talking to us about Killane Castle near Ayr and its history before Robert Adam. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I, yeah, my name is Derek Alexander. I work for uh, the other organisation that looks after cultural heritage in Scotland, so the National Trust for Scotland, which is a charity. And as part of that, I've been working for them for 20 years, looking after some of uh, the most iconic castles and uh, places uh, of natural and cultural heritage across Scotland. Um, so some of our castles include Drum Castle, uh, Fivey, uh, Strom Castle, a ruin, one of the few ruins. Most of ours actually tend to have roofs on them already. Um, so we have a, a long history of of, of looking after this, the structures and often the collections. Uh, so people tend not to think associated us with the National Trust for Scotland with ruins, but um, we'll see that that's uh, something that goes back a long way. So if we could get the first slide, please, that would be great. So if what I'm going to do today is focus on one of the castles on the Ayrshire coast, Killeen Castle. Um, and if you live in the west coast of Scotland uh, and went to school in Glasgow or anywhere like that, you'll have probably gone on school trips uh, down to Killeen. Uh, one of the things you probably do is actually probably going to the seaside was one of the it's one of the nicest places to go down to the seaside. Uh, and you'll have seen uh, Killeen Castle in its spectacular setting, uh, and it's it's well known and it's one of the things it's it's the one of the chief houses of the Kennedy family. Uh, but it's also well known, obviously, for Robert Adam, and the architect on the 18th century, who turned it into this uh, wonderful uh, country house mansion, I suppose. And I think that's the thing. What is a castle? People come to Killeen and they look at it. They see castellated crenellations going around the, the wall heads. Um, and they think, wait a minute, is this a real castle? Uh, and they look at the defences, and you know, it's uh, those those show pieces of artillery there, which are referencing uh, the military might of the Kennedys. But th these are later things, um, and are really there for show. So we have the mortar battery in front, and then the sort of eighteen um, just after the Napoleonic Wars, eighteen sixteen. Uh, gun battery there, really, which never fired a shot in anger. It's really there just for show. Um, so what, what, what about the medieval castle or the earlier castle at Killeen? What evidence do we have? So when you look at Killeen from an aerial photograph, you'll see that the core of the castle, if you've been, you'll, you're, you'll be very familiar with it. It's got the large drum tower overlooking the cliff. It's got the walled garden below it. Um, it's got caves underneath. We'll come back to those at the end. Um, and it's surrounded by a, a mixture of really 19th century landscaping uh, and some later 20th century uh, additions. Um, Killeen, there is a, where we get our understanding as a defensive site is from really from the sea. Um, you don't get it as much from the land if you come across the viaduct, uh, across the, the walled garden, but its location on a cliff top setting uh, with a, almost a sort of ridge and a base at either end, and what would have originally been a lot deeper uh, gully on the landward side, it is quite a defensive location. 
Uh, and unfortunately, we, we, there's hardly any of the um, older castle. We know that the Kennedys go back to the sort of 12th, 13th century. Um, we know that there was a castle here, probably certainly from the 15th century, if not earlier. Um, but our only record of it is from some very few documentary sources and some later sketches undertaken really by Robert Adam uh, and his compatriots at that time before uh, the castle was converted. And there are three sketches that I want to just quickly look at. Um, the first one is this one here, uh, drawn by Robert Adam himself uh, from the southwest view of the castle. And uh, here it shows before he's done any work to it. So you can see in the middle, it's dominated by a, an L-shaped tower house, marked here as H, I, and J there, or G, surrounded by a barmkin wall, an enclosure wall with a small C gate marked at B there, uh, and some later additions, probably a kitchen block at K, uh, and a, a later accommodation block right on the cliff edge above the caves at, at L. And this is one of the few um, uh, really nice pictures of the castle before Robert Adam changes it, and you can see. I mean, if you drop that in any other part of Scotland, do you go? That's a you know, that's a medieval castle. This is now in the collection of the Sir John So Museum down in London. So, if you move round to uh, the east view, um, you get a similar sort of um, uh, complementary image, but a quietly different type of sketch. This one's in the Royal Scottish Academy. Uh, again, you can see the tower house in the middle. Um, you can see uh, a, a, a sort of lean-to tower at F and the kitchen block chimneys just sticking its chimneys up over the, the barmkin wall that surrounds this side of the castle. Uh, and you can also see uh, the courtyard, which is the courtyard of the stable blocks that were built in the 1760s. Uh, P and Q and J there. Um, and that's, you know, that's when the castle is starting to become a home farm, um, which it probably always acted as, as part of the wider medieval estate. And in the final sketch, um, if you move round to looking uh, from the sort of uh, northeast, uh, again, you're looking directly into the, the, the stable yard block. This one's uh, done by John Clark of Eldon and belongs to the National Galleries. Uh, and you can see the, the tower here quite nicely. And this one's shown with some battlements around it as well. So I don't know whether that's um, a bit of artistic license or because the other ones seem to show that the battlements had been removed. Um, but there's a debate about when these sketches are made. Of course, these sketches aren't photographs. Um, so, you know, people drew them as they wanted to see them. So often they are biased. But here again, we can see the kitchen block and the uh, angled accommodation block that was knocked down by Robert Adam uh, uh, before he started the construction work on the, the larger uh, house itself. So if we go to the, um, the map of the, um, what we can see, the black arrow at the bottom left is from the view from the first sketch that we looked at. Uh, and the other two are from the east and from the northeast. So it gives you an idea of the range of structures that uh, rotate around the castle. Uh, and I've outlined here on the current Ordnance Survey map where we think if you go into the castle itself, the, the House of Killeen, uh, if you pass through from the armory into the what's called the dining room or the sitting room, uh, you'll see there's a, a, the thickness of the walls of the medieval tower is preserved, but it, that's the only bit of medieval masonry that is a hint of what was there previously. Um, still called a castle, uh, but there's hardly any of the uh, 16th and 17th century structures on show. Um, this is showing roughly where I think the Barmkin Wall uh, ran around on the outside. Um, and the other piece of evidence that we have for the uh, original layout of Killeen, of the um, uh, medieval and post-medieval, comes from the estate map, which was drawn in 1755 by uh, John Fullis, um, for as he was the estate manager. Uh, and here you can see 
Um, the castle shown as end on in a play school drawing fashion. Um, so it's, it shows the, the, uh, the main block of the tower and the kitchen. Uh, and to the top of the screen here, you'll see the walls of the walled garden that were built in the mid 18th century. Uh, most of the buildings on this map are marked by black squares, and you'll see a number of black squares here. One underneath the castle, right on the coastal edge, is probably uh, marking uh, the position of the caves uh, underneath the castle. Uh, and what I've done is I rotated this map around so it goes with the, the estate map, uh, with the current Ordnance Survey map, so you can see how, the, how it overlaps with the um, with the rest of the features that we've just identified, um, so the walled garden, uh, which is um, marked at X there with the, and W with the three walls running up to the tower house at G and the kitchen block at K, uh, and you can maybe just see some of the other buildings that are marked around at um, as black rectangles, and the ones we're really interested here are U and V which are right on the coast, which are the only bits of medieval masonry that are standing at Killeen if you visit today. And to do that, um, we're talking about hidden secret passages and things like that at castles, and that's what intrigues us. Uh, that's what Killeen has got in spades, and it's underneath the castle, the caves underneath, uh, which is um, we've done a bit of survey and the excavation work in. Uh, and uh, you can see the fronting of the caves um in the next image there we go um and what this clearly marks out is that the castle is reasonably partly there for the reason of defense on the cliff uh, and good access from the sea and obviously defended from the land by a gully but these caves go back uh, quite a long way we've got a radiocarbon dates going back to the iron age from these caves and burials in them going back uh, to the early historic period but these stone walls uh, defended the caves where they were used probably as a combination of storage uh, and possibly also uh, prison. Uh, they're later used by smugglers. Uh, but what you can see, the black arrows on here are marking the probably way of approach up to the castle. Uh, and that was forgotten about. The, uh, just at the corner of the drum tower above, there's a door that comes out on the cliff face that shouldn't be there for any other reason the fact that it actually marks the old way down uh, to the caves below so the idea that the caves were uh, that the castle was defensive um, the uh, it's also partly storage and, and when uh, Nikki was talking about all the different uh, uses of castles uh, uh, um, in terms of uh, stabling uh, storage uh, brew houses chapels uh, cook houses, all that sort of thing would have been within the Barmkin wall at Killeen and has all been completely obliterated by Robert Adams' masterpiece uh, in the 1770s to the 1792. Um, we've done bits of excavation uh, in the caves and uh, around the estate, but what we need to remember is these castles uh, form part of a wider landscape of features, uh, and one of the things that we've got on the wider estate at Killeen is this earthwork feature which produced a radiocarbon date, date of uh, 13th to 14th century uh, and it's in the field uh, up to the uh, uh, sort of east of uh, Killeen Castle itself and you just wonder what was the, what was the re relationship between this feature and the castle on its cliff edge. Um, so they're part. What we've always got to remember is they're part of a wider landscape. It's not just about the castle itself. And so I'll stop there. That's great, Derek. Thanks for that. I've definitely learned a few things about Kaleem myself tonight, um, including that Robert Adam has quite a lot to answer for. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> We've got a few questions already. I um, think we should have time for one or two. Um, the first one is from William Cross on Facebook, and it's, what's the current state of Killeen Castle with regards to coastal erosion? It's it's not too bad because it, obviously the, uh, the, the cliff that it sits on is pretty solid and isn't going anywhere too fast. Uh, we Every now and again, we get a storm surge and it has an impact on 
uh, the area just in front of the castle cave, and that's scouring away some of the material there. So we just have to keep an eye on it, and we, we continue to do monitoring work uh, and check that there's nothing, no major bits of it are going to... Every now and again, small bits of cliff will fall off, but no, nothing drastic yet, fingers crossed. That's a relief to hear. I know that climate change is um, definitely causing a lot of trouble in terms of conservation of these sites. Um, another question from Elizabeth on Facebook. What's your favourite part of the castle? And the, also, does it have any secrets? Well, yeah, I mean, the favourite part of the castle has to be the caves. Um, it doesn't get much better than that. <laughs> um, it's And it get, the caves get cut off at high tide. And when you're down there, at the coastal edge and the tides comes right in, you feel really quite separated and cut off. But if there was had been a stairway, a wooden, we think there was probably a wooden timber stair linking the two together. Um, and it's those sort of timber elements that were sort of missing that, you know, help us interpret the site, which is a shame. So that, yeah, that's, a, that's the best bit for me. Um, another one, um from Chucky Frolic on YouTube, is Killeen more of a stately home uh, than a castle now then? Well, that's, I mean, that's that's what the whole, this is what the whole debate about what, what is a castle. I mean, what it does have, it has, you know, it has a, a, a medieval predecessor, you know, so it's got, it's got, it's got form. Um, so the fact that this is one of Robert Adams' first sort of castellated designs, which then leads into the sort of Scots baronial in the 19th century, uh, I mean, this became a classic feature in, in terms of architectural style, um, but it's built on something that was real. Uh, and many castles and many stately homes uh, have, you know, origins very similar to Killeen, where they have, you know, they, they were estate centres that have a long pedigree going back into the into the medieval period, if not earlier. And as I say, this site has Iron Age, you know, radiocarbon dates and things going back as well. So it's such a good site. It would have always been used. And I think that's the thing people think of it and go, big fancy house. But no, it's it's got more to it than that. Yeah, it's great how many layers there are in such a long history of occupation. I think we'll have one more quick question. Um, Charlotte on Facebook says, you mentioned the walled garden. Um, were there walled... Were there Sorry, were the gardens walled to keep out animals, whether invaders, or was it just a kind of design feature? Uh, uh, so not, not so much keeping out invaders, but certainly keeping out animals. Uh, also, but to provide protection for plants, uh, so to keep, stop the coastal wind coming in, and also to radiate heat that's south-facing um, in that gully on the south side of the, on the east side of the castle. So it, can, it gets quite warm and they could grow. I mean, they were growing fruit trees and things really quite early from, you know, the sort of, certainly from the 17th century, uh, they're mentioned at Killeen. Uh, and we've found the earlier version of the wall surviving under the, the fountain court there before the, the wall garden was pushed away in the, in the 19th century to be built, uh, or oh, sorry, the late 18th century to be built um, uh, further inland, if you're aware of Colleen today, the, the walled garden's actually sort of divorced from the castle now. And that's a pattern you see again and again. It's almost like they're designing their own little microclimate then within that walled garden. That's exactly what it's about. These guys, the gardeners knew what they were doing. Yeah, they mm -hmm. were really good at it. <laughs> That's great. Um, I think that's all the questions we have coming in just now. So um, plenty more at the end, but at this point, we'll hand over to our last speaker. Thanks again, Derek. Thanks, Rachel. So next we have Simon Montgomery. Simon is a historic buildings advisor within our heritage directorate, and he'll be talking about a very different kind of castle, Kinloch Castle on the island of Rum which was built in 1897. Kinloch Castle has always inspired much interest and affection as a time capsule of Edwardian extravagance, but its castellated architecture has also attracted criticism from experts on Scottish castles. Simon will be exploring whether those critics might just be right. Hello everyone. Uh, good evening. Um, I work with Listed Buildings at Historic Environment Scotland. Um, one of the buildings that I've been involved with is Kinloch Castle on the island of Rum. It's a completely new castle 
that was built by the Bullock family in 1897 <coughs> and owned by them uh, until the whole island, including the castle and its contents, um, came into the ownership of Nature Conservancy, now Nature Scott, in the 1950s. Kinloch is well known for the fact that it survives largely as the Bullocks left it, but depending on who you ask, this fairy tale castle is either a sleeping beauty or an ugly duck sister, or maybe a Cinderella waiting for its moment. It's a castle that inspires much interest and affection, and yet historians haven't been very kind to it. Um, when trying to put it into a Scottish architectural context, and therefore you will nearly always see it referred to in the context of its social value, usually summed up in the phrase an Edwardian time capsule. If we go back to the previous slide, you'll see there's a map, which just to show you where um, Kinloch is, it sits, uh, Rum sits, it sits south of uh, Skye there. Um, in the following slide, we've got uh, portraits of the of uh, Sir George and Lady Monica Bullock, um, who built uh, Kinloch as a shooting lodge um, in 1897 uh, with money from the family's textile machinery business in Lancashire. The, the next picture shows the, the architecture of the building, which was designed by Leeming and Leeming, who were, architect, who were an architect's firm from Halifax. The red sandstone of its shell was reputed, reputedly imported from Arran, and even the soil it sits on was imported by boat from Ayrshire. Now, when Kinloch was originally listed, our predecessors would have listed buildings for their special architectural or historic interest. But we understand now that this is a rather old-fashioned way of looking at buildings, and perhaps one of the reasons Kinloch hasn't fared so well in past appraisals. When thinking about buildings, Historic Environment Scotland now takes a broader approach of thinking about their cultural significance. In the next slide, you'll see a picture of Sign, the hall at Sign House. Um, and this is a, an English interior designed by a Scottish architect, Robert Adam, who we've just been hearing about. Um, and uh, in this case, there's really nothing in this room that isn't a comment on the intellectual and artistic status of the owner. Um, so a very typical example of what special architectural interest is. If we look at the hall at Kinloch, by contrast, this is the next slide. Um, the Neo-Jacobean interior clearly represents the 19th century interest in romanticism of the past and so has some elements of the arts and crafts movement, but nothing that seems to have got architectural historians excited in, in the past, other than the exceptional quality in how it was made. You can see in this next picture uh, a light fitting that was designed for the house. Um, it was one of the earliest houses to have electricity. Um, and in the next picture, th this marvelous machine that sits in the hall called an orchestrion, which was uh, built to um, create the sound of an entire orchestra. These are interesting technological innov innovations, but they still say more about the historical social value of Kinloch than anything else. So in the next picture, um, I've said um, that the castle's architecture hasn't fared so well in past appraisals, but let's have a think about that briefly. Um, the next picture is uh, of Balmoral Castle and, um, um, sorry, in, in the past historians have tried to put Kinloch into the context of Victorian Scottish architecture, um, Scots baronial houses, and uh, 16th century castles and tower houses that they were based on. Um, Balmoral Castles built some, 50, built some 50 years earlier is generally regarded as the building that started the craze for getting yourself a brand new Scottish castle. It was when I, my first visit to Kinloch and I went into one of the bedrooms, which you'll see in this next picture, um, if uh, that the panelling had been removed from below the window. Uh, moving in a bit closer, uh, you can see if you, in the next slide, um, you can see that I, I, I saw that the 
castles actually built of brick. And between the two inner layers of brick, um, there was a, a, a layer of asphalt. And that made me think, um, this is a building that's definitely built by an industrialist. And industrialists like the latest technology, and they always liked to um, engage the latest thinking on everything. Um, but where did this four square tower at each corner architecture really come from? If we go to the next slide, yes, thank you. Um, uh, as you can see, um, it's a courtyard form with a tower at each corner and then the main um, entrance tower on the right. Um, in the next slide, we have a picture, um, a very um, rare picture of Inverary Castle <coughs> before the conical tower caps were put on the towers. Um, and when it comes to revival architecture, Inverary is probably the great grandparent of, of them all. Um, it's astonishingly early, bu being built in the 1730s, and really one of the earliest examples of revival architecture in the UK, along with Strawberry Hill. Um, so moving on, uh, you can see that um, this is Taymouth Castle. Uh, Killeen that we've just seen comes in between these two. Um, but um, Taymouth Castle, um, which dates from 1806, um, has towers, round towers at the corners that are very similar to Kinloch. Um, and you can see um, it also has a ground floor walkway um, around, around, around it um, with castellations on it. Um, so in the, in the next slides, sorry, next slide, please. Um, oh. uh, I'm sorry, that I seem to have, um, can you, um, sorry, yes. Sorry, Tamos and um, Inverary are very much early forms of revivalism that like to make reference to Gothic medieval castles and churches, but Kinloch is a little more conventionally baronial, like a Scottish castle. Um, however, the, um, the mullioned windows and courtyard form, uh, um, and the fact that it had English architects put me on to looking at manor houses in, in Cumbria and Lancashire, um, and then Tudor manor houses like Hurstmanso in the next slide. Um, and sorry, if you'd like to move on, uh, that's it. Thank you. Um, uh, and then in the uh, you'll see a better picture of it in the next slide. Um, uh, and you can see uh, that with its moat, bridge, and courtyard, Hurstmanso, which is in, in Sussex, right down in the southeast of England, um, at the end of the 19th century, a castle like this would have been seen as the perfect fusion of a romantic castle and a comfortable house. And I think this is really what the Bullocks wanted at Kinloch. Um, so next slide, please. Um, but what about these three distinctive Mullion Bay windows that you can see um, in the middle of the facade at first floor level? Well, Leeming and Leeming, they were from Halifax in Yorkshire, but they also had an office in London. Uh, so I started looking at Tudor manor houses in, in uh, T Tudor courtyard houses in London. And in the next slide, you'll see uh, St. James's Palace. Um, and you can see the, um, the bay windows um, at first floor level above a, um, a sort of covered walkway, all with crenellations on it. These windows would have originally been mullions. So um, uh, Kinloch is actually trying to recreate the original appearance of these. Um, now, next slide, please. A colleague once said to me, I can give you all of the background on what is architecturally distinctive about a, uh, uh, architecturally distinctive about a building and put that in a social historical context but I can't tell you how you should feel about that building. I think this is particularly relevant to Kinloch, where historians have fretted over the correctness of its architectural origins. But actually, Kinloch's main interest is as a piece of theater, 
And theatre, like any art, is about how it makes you feel. The theatre in this case is the rugged journey across the sea to a warm welcoming by a roaring fire within the romantic interiors of the castle. This is the theatre of escapism and the theatre of arrival. And I'll finish by showing you how Kinloch was sp specifically laid out for this effect and how the architecture of the castle extends into its setting. So firstly, in the next slide, there was the journey by sea and, we, and the Bullocks had their very own yacht for this, this specific purpose. This is interesting because it means that the first view that you see of Kinloch, which is in the next picture, is how it was meant to be understood and appreciated. Um, so if you could go back to the, um, that's it. Um, uh, it was meant to be understood. It explains the architecture had to be quite simplistic in order to, for the building to hold its own in its rugged mountainous setting. Um, simplistic, if not verging on crude for the purpose of this effect. So if we look at the aerial view, um, you can see that on the, on the very right of this picture, the, you can see the pier where you would have arrived in the yacht and you would have alighted onto the pier and been welcomed into a carriage. And then um, it would have um, rumbled along a winding track along the coast um, giving you views of the castle, um, and then uh, and then you would plunge into a wood um, and turn at right angles into the, into the and see the following view, uh, which is a long straight avenue lined by rhododendron bushes, um, and then this view uh, terminates in the next um, in a Gothic bridge, um, and at that point you see the castle at an angle. And uh, um, uh, so, it, and it's angled in that way for maximum effect to make it appear as big as possible. Um, and then, uh, as uh, uh, and finally, you arrive at the castle itself, and you're welcomed in uh, into the next uh, into and handed a drink or a cup of tea by a roaring fire. So there you are. Kinloch is very much a castle of its time in being a piece of theatre that provides a stage for all of the interactions associated with entertainment to play out. Um, it's of, of special architectural interest um, for its construction and technology, also being as much of an English castle as a Scottish castle. But in terms of its cultural significance, however, if you were a person that has made that remarkable rugged journey and were now sitting beside this fire with a cup of tea or a glass of whiskey, you might not be able to give me an account of which Jacobean house inspired the panelling around you or how many animals died in the making of this particular movie. If you feel free to be yourself or possibly even someone else in the way that people do when they escape, then I would say that in terms of what the Bullocks and their own architects set out to achieve, you understand perfectly what makes this particular castle a castle. Thank you. Thanks very much, Simon. That's fascinating. I love how carefully designed the castle was to create such a dramatic kind of effect on visitors. Um, and that idea of castles evoking feeling is, um, it's really important and probably one that's had kind of that's been a part of castle design for hundreds of years too. We have a few questions specifically on Kinloch Castle, which is great. The first one from Chucky Frolic on YouTube is that the inside the hall looks familiar. Has it been used as a filming location? Um it may have been, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. And uh but um, it does appear, I mean, it does appear on the web a lot. Um, and a lot of people um, visit it and take photographs. Um, so you do see it. Um, so the Cheshire Ramblers, for example, um, put photographs on it. A fantastic picture that I used in the title page um, on their website. Um, so one of the best pictures I've seen of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a popular image then. Yes. Um, 
we will have time to open up to all of the speakers. So if everybody listening wants to have a think of other questions, um, the first we'll have one or two more for Kinlock Castle, uh, for Simon on Kinlock. Um, Elizabeth on Facebook asks, are there records of the costs of importing the um, stone to the Isle of Rum? And do you have a modern day estimate for those costs? Mm, gosh, I'm afraid um, I haven't done my research. I mean, I've done a lot of reading on um, there are a lot of stats associated with how many gardeners it had, you know, it had these amazing gardens, supposedly with alligators and hummingbirds and all sorts of things, and how many gardeners were required to um, maintain this. But um, I can't remember any any of the stats, but they, they are fantastic when you read them. I, I don't remember a particular... Um, I don't remember particularly reading about the costs. Um, I suppose but, all uh, the, these um, things. Sorry, go on. Sorry, car carry on. Sorry, carry on. I was going to say, I suppose the um, brick superstructure probably cut down on the cost a bit. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, but I mean, it was, um, you know, you're talking about thousands of tons of soil brought over on boats uh, to create the flat site that it sits on. Um, and then all the stone being, um, I, I would imagine that probably the stone was cut to size um, at its source and then probably brought over um, and then finished on site rather than being brought over in huge lumps. Um, that's the way I've seen it done, but I'm not sure in this case. And last question specifically on Kinlock. Um, Lindsay on Facebook says she read a post um, by the Buildings at Risk Register um, stating that Kinlock Castle may be at risk of demolition due to disuse. Um, is this correct? And what do you think the future holds for Kinlock Castle? Um, well, <clears throat> at the moment, the castle is, I mean, the castle is still owned by um, Nature Scott, who are the successors to the Nature Conservancy. Um, and uh, they were concerned that um, uh, that demolition might be the only option for its future. Um, but we've been in discussion with them uh, for um, uh, a number of years about it. Um, and the present position is that they're looking for, uh, they, 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 they've been spending um, a lot of money uh, keeping it going, um, but it is really surplus to their requirements. So they're looking for a beneficial owner um, at present um, and a beneficial owner would be someone or, or uh, an operation um, that um, would look after the heritage of the castle, um, would benefit the community and local economy um, and also um, have some role in um, sustaining on um, preserving the natural heritage. Um, Rum is uh, almost entirely a nature reserve, so that's that's the key uh, function of Nature Scott, um, uh, and uh, they're looking for someone that can work in with those aims and the community. Let's hope that they can find a use for it. It can be such a challenge for these um, old buildings. Yes, that's right. Um, I think we've come a long way um, just in understanding the building because um, it hadn't been very well understood, particularly this um, strange construction. Um, and uh, so I think we have the answers to what the the physical problems are. It's just that um, it, it's a case of finding uh, someone who has the money to um, to to take it on and fix it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, we'll um, wrap that up there and think open up the floor to questions from all of the speakers. We've got a few minutes spare at the end. Hi, everybody. Um, we've already got one question come in um, from Heather on Facebook. Um, she says, we mentioned climate change's impact on historic castles. What work is being implemented to prevent and preserve these historic sites and castles in particular? Um, any one of you want to kick us off? 
Derek, go on. Uh, um, Colleen, coming back to Colleen, one of the things that we, we've had to do over the years there is um, lots of stonework repair, mainly because this, the stonework, the sandstone that Robert Adam used is incredibly soft and it's on such an exposed location that gets a lot of erosion. So it's been, we've had ongoing uh, stonework replacement. So it's quite, uh, it's, it, I mean, with all these things, it's you've just got to keep on top of them. Um, so I'm sure the others have got similar experiences from from their examples too. Imagine if one's on the coast to get a, quite a battering. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly one of the issues with Kish Mill. Um, it's such an exposed location, but yeah, we do find it at castles up and down. I mean, part of the problem is that you know the stone is now exposed to the elements where in their active life they would have been at least lime washed if not fully harled so that would be acting as a sort of sacrificial layer as it were um so you know for all some people might perhaps not like the the gold of the great hall at sterling castle the the, the harling there does at least uh, keep the the stonework in, in a bit more protection um so yeah as Derek says it really is just sort of keeping on top of that daily maintenance and uh, yeah, it's uh, an ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. Maintenance and monitoring is key. Simon, are you yeah. seeing um, changes in casework because of climate change? Um, not um, so much, but I mean, uh, um, it, it. I think the the biggest change really is the amount of water that you get in a short amount of time. So we get these torrential, tropical type down downpours, and we're finding that buildings um, aren't coping in the way that they used to um, they're, they're, you know in actually disposing of the the water so um, you know we, 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 we get the occasional kind of accidents where where uh, the rainwater goods just can't cope and um, uh, so we're seeing applications for people um, you know in in uh, um, basically enlarging all of the rainwater goods. Um, sometimes uh, with somebody like Colleen, this can be quite a major thing, <laughs> potentially, <laughs> with lots of lead parapets and things yeah. like that. Um, and yeah, uh, I think that's the, that's the one that really stands out. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, we have quite a different question now. This is one that was submitted in advance of the talks today, but I think it's still one we can all um, think about. Um, this came in from Richard, and it's, do all castles have dungeons? And I suppose, all, why all the good would ones. they have dungeons? <laughs> yeah, all the good ones have dungeons, I think. I mean, as, <laughs> as, a, as a kid going around the castle, that was what you wanted, wasn't it? You wanted to go and see the dungeon and you wanted to get up onto the battlements. And for mm -hmm. me, that's still what castles are. If you can get to a dark hole somewhere in it and look in, then it makes <laughs> it a castle. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I would, Nikki will be able to tell you more about the historical background to dungeons and things, that side of things. But obviously, most castles are power bases. And, you know, so the, the people who, the lordly centres that they represent had judicial power over the local populace so you were they had the their what was it pits and gallows and all that side of things so they, yeah. they could do that yeah i mean yeah you it's good to have a sort of a, a nice dank dark hole to drop some near dwells uh, down just to emphasize that they've uh, been naughty um and, and some of that is you know what we traditionally think of as a dungeon you know down on you know underground and damp and dark and you know, you're dropped down through a hatch and kind of left to rot until you pay your fine, maybe. Or, you know, if you're particularly unlucky, you end up in the bottle dungeon at uh, St Andrew's Castle, which is a particularly nasty one. Or you end up in the one at Black Ness, which is kind of <laughs> submerged every time the time comes in. So, uh, yeah, but every castle would have somewhere to lock up uh, a, a person who was doing things that the Lord thought they shouldn't. Um, but whether that is a dungeon in the sense of being shackled to the walls is uh, perhaps another matter. But they were certainly not yeah. the most pleasant spaces. No, definitely not. Especially that one at Blackness. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wouldn't want to be there. I'm sure there's some, some antiquarian report about finding a, a, an arm bone still in the shackle or, or, or something attached. <laughs> um, whether that's an urban legend, uh, who knows? 
I think we only have time for one more question now, um, but this one seems a good one to end on. Um, this is from Fiona on Facebook. Um, castles are often described as a combination of a fortress, a show of power and a home. What is each of the speaker's thoughts on that? Uh, I suppose, are they a combination of all of them? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, but, but there may be different emphasis at different times. I mean, I would imagine buildings, you know, sort of uh, reflect the times that they're in. Um, so in times of wealth and the power, they might be more about display in terms of trouble, it's about, more about defence, but, you know, very often always a home of some form and that you've got to live there. Yes, I think, uh, sorry. No, go ahead. I think as someone who deals with a little later period, which is beyond the defensive phase, um, I'm interested in the way that the design and the scale of a building, con you know, conveys um, a, a sense of power um, uh, if it's designed to impress. Um, and that's just the same for the older ones, somewhere like Castle of May, which sits above the um, the rocky coast on the Pentland Firth. Um, it, it originally faced northwards and uh, it was a clear sign to everyone that, um, of the power of the owners, because uh, at that time everyone travelled by by boat, and uh, um, it would have been a very impressive edifice sitting up um, on the coast. And um, uh, now, now it's been completely turned round and turned into a comfortable home since the 18th century, um, and it's a very different place. Um, but uh, the key thing really is that everyone travelled by boat, and it changes your understanding of those statement that it made. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that notion of the the display is, is the key thing because at certain times you want to display certain things. So at St Andrew's Castle, you add on round towers when you want to display that you're defending against artillery, which is the new thing you have to defend against. So it's that adaptation across time as fashions change, as needs change, as desires change, um, which is why it's so hard to kind of pin down what is a castle because what is a castle in 1400 mm -hmm. is different to what a castle is in 1800 is mm -hmm. different to what a castle is now but I think at the end of the day it's still about that displaying power and authority whatever that means to the builders at the time. And I think the one thing that ties it old and new together is the issue of scale because the funny thing about many Scottish buildings is that you as you walk up to them they get smaller rather than bigger because they're designed to look bigger than they are. Um, we have some genuinely big castles and country houses in Scotland, but not very many. Um, and that's that's really quite interesting, uh, parallel with Victorian, Georgian and ancient mm. architecture that they were designed perhaps to look bigger than, than they actually mm. were. I find that really interesting throughout all the talks tonight that despite the fact that these are such different castles built at different times and for different reasons initially they there's such common themes and these kind of um with the architecture really being designed to display and show power and kind of might um is common to all of them um, I think we'll have to wrap it up there, but a thank you so much to all of you um, all everybody at home for tuning in on such a beautiful sunny evening and to all of our speakers. Um, please do let us know what you thought of tonight's talks. You can do so by following the link to our short survey and remember that um, the talk will be available to you um, to watch again or to share via our YouTube channel and Facebook pages. So thank you, Simon, Nikki and Derek. And thanks to everybody at home. Thank you.